Rock art is a worldwide phenomenon with clear local influences and unique characteristics. There may still be deep roots of rock art that commonly connects us all to the natural world. One approach to these common connections is detailed in my Prehistoria paper, Lunar Timekeeping in Upper Paleolithic Cave Art, that is the source document for this presentation. By the Upper Paleolithic, we generally refer to a time period between 50,000 to 10,000 years ago. In the Upper Paleolithic, there were cultures, such as the Magdalenian in Europe, which lasted from 17,000 to 12,000 years ago, and was the period these images were made. These proposed time-factored lunar count marks are depicted with straight lines, rectangular designs, strings of dots, and other shapes. Many other hypotheses have emerged to describe these marks, including hunting magic and tallies, fertility and initiation rites, art for art's sake, and altered states of consciousness. The lunar notation hypothesis was initially forwarded by the American science writer Alexander Marshak, who utilized a microscope to closely study thousands of upper Paleolithic artifacts. His major work in this area is the roots of civilization, as printed in 1972. The details of Marshak's work are intriguing, and everyone in fields related to prehistory have been influenced by him. Marshak proved, without a doubt, that Iceman could count and had sense of the moon phases. In a train of thought that may have been long ahead of his time, Marshak had forwarded the notion that we are today more technically advanced than Ice Age people, but not smarter. Marshak's work has remained a controversial read, which may partly be due to his never answering the question of what might have been the practical applications of the lunar markings in relation to the actual animals depicted on the portable objects and cave walls. In other words, Marshak never established a measurable motive for his proposed lunar counts in Upper Paleolithic imagery. My work on this enigma started in 2002, when studying how migratory animals in nature time their life history events. I call this phenomena biological time. This path of travel ultimately led me to examine hunter-gatherer and pastoral calendars, then later to Upper Paleolithic cave images in an attempt to answer some of the same questions Marshak proposed. Like Marshak, I accidentally fell into this arena through examinations in a related field of study. Through the research of animal migrations with salmonids, for example, I recognize that they have light-dark migration rhythms orchestrated by the sun and moon. This graph describes the upstream migration from the Pacific Ocean of salmonoid steelhead trout, with the lowest movement around the full moon periods. This graph describes the peak of coho salmon spawning activity, around the full moons over 13 years. The data indicates that salmonids migrate most proficiently during the dark nights and hold during these light night periods, which they engage in group behavior, such as spawning, which leads to the later downstream migration of the coho salmon fry during dark moon nights. One might question if the salmonid events are entrained to the lunar-driven ocean tides from which they migrate to and from. This graph from a study led by Oregon State Aquatic Entomologist Dr. Norm Anderson describes the dark moon movement of invertebrates in rivers. The field data indicates that the salmonid migration and spawning activity is not entrained by the ocean tides, but rather light dark lunar activity that extends up and down the food chain. There are identified examples of lunar light dark behavior represented across the animal kingdom, and the discussion is mainstream. Native Americans or First Nations people, such as the Thompson Indians of British Columbia, held this biological information in their lunar calendars, as highlighted in red, for salmon migrating upstream. This mature kipped Atlantic salmon at Abri du Poisson, near to a shore of the Vizere River, which runs alongside the Lascaux Cave, is engraved with 13 marks that may indicate the full moon spawning period which we previously observed for the coho salmon. A common worldwide intuitive method of lunar counting is 13 from the first crescent moon to the first full moon. On the Thompson Indian lunar calendar, we also find the major life history events of deer, such as when they rut, shed their antlers, and drop their young. One Thompson band reset their lunar calendar by the rutting of the black-tailed deer. 
Other bands reset their lunar calendars by the rutting of mountain goats, which are an ibex, as well as the rutting of bighorn sheep and when groundhogs go to their winter dens. The Thompson's observations of lunar-influenced behavior for bighorn sheep can be supported in this Nevada study published with the U.S. Geological Survey. The research group found these animals to have lunar migration patterns, whereby the most evening movement occurred when the moon was brightest. The light and dark cycles of the moon synchronize animal behavior for their life history events. The approaches of the Thompson bands to resetting the lunar calendars to biological events of animals resolves a fundamental problem with solar lunar calendars. The 29.5-day lunar cycle of light and dark night doesn't divide evenly into the solar calendar year, pushing the calendar back 11 days each year. Other animals can't keep pushing their biological activity back 11 days each year as they would be out of season for their events. Instead, they respond to solar lunar light dark cues that shift these events back and forth from one year to the next in seasonal windows of time. Migrating salmon, waterfowl, and other animals are never early or late for a meal, migrations, and reproductive events. They are on their own time, their biological time. We may find evidence of seeing the future through biological time and lunar synchronized behavior with these stags in the Lascaux cave. They are likely red deer crossing a river. We can see their heads bobbing back and forth in uneven current. The lower stag looks as though he is plunging into a pool. The four stag has seven spheres floating between his antlers, counting seven lunations from the vernal equinox. This would approximately be our month of October and when stags would have migrated to breed. This is also the approximate start of the lunar calendar for the Thompson Band, which cued off the black-tailed deer rut. A test of this lunation after the vernal equinox start period can be determined by whether the practice is found on other panels in the Lascaux Cave Complex. We will return to this yearly start of lunar calendar question shortly. The observed and recorded rutting of the black-tailed deer within the lunation among the Thompson may also be expressed with this black stag at the Lascaux Cave with 13 dots leading from the first crescent moon to the first full moon at the box. We can see the resemblance between the Lascaux black stag and this rutting red deer stag. Note the large antler sets, arch necks, and hot breasts calling in the females during a cool autumn morning. We again find a count of 13 and a box with this major stag in rutting condition at Lascaux. Reading from the viewers left to right, we may find another count of 13 landing to a box formed by the four legs of this pregnant mare at Lascaux. But in this case, the dots continue on, suggesting that the depicted event for this pregnant mare occurs later in the lunar cycle during the darker nights. This nomenclature could indicate an important event such as foaling, that is the dropping of the young. One field biology reference for lunar-timed birthing of ungulates comes from the Canadian zoologist Dr. Anthony Sinclair, who back-calculated the dropping of blue wildebeest calves in the Serengeti to show that the start of the rut was at full moon and the first dropping of the calves was at new moon. Blue wildebeest have a 257-day or 8.7 lunation gestation period to make this astrobiologically possible. Sinclair proposed that the dark nights gave calves a better chance at avoiding carnivores. The lunar-timed life history strategy can be observed for reindeer, as highlighted in red on the calendar of the Chukchi herders. These Siberian people live by the rhythms of the moon, or rather live with the rhythms of reindeer, which are biologically cued by light-dark signals from both the moon and sun. These timing concepts of wildebeest, deer, and reindeer may help us to identify a lunar calendar in the grid above this late-stage pregnant mare at the Lascaux Axial Gallery. First, we need to review the life history strategy of horses, similar to the blue wildebeest. For mares, there is an offset in the gestation period to about a half lunation. Thus, if a horse breeds at the full moon, she will drop her foal in the dark of the moon after a 336-day or 11.4 lunation gestation period. Among captive mares, studies show that foaling occurs primarily at night, with the maximum incidence between 10 and 11 p.m. This biological timing is an evolutionary life history strategy to protect the newly dropping foal against predators and is carried on even when those dangers are not present. 
the Lascaux Cave artists could have started their yearly lunar calendar with the dropping of the foal as the first lunation, an event of another time resetting animal, or from the first lunation after the vernal equinox. In either of these cases, the dot in the center of the first box at 1Y would indicate the dropping of the foal. This biological event is after the vernal equinox lunation beginning time and consistent with the proposed lunar count start for the five stags crossing a river, as previously depicted. The reading direction for this grid is from the viewer's right to left as the moon rises in the spring to summer sky. The syntax was in the details, just as it is with the written language today. The recognition of full dropping is found among the Yakut of Siberia in their lunar calendar. The fall he catches is in approximately our month of April. Some Thompson Indian bands in British Columbia reset their lunar calendar with the rutting of mountain goats, which we may substitute with these alpine ibex. Here, we have a male ibex in black and pregnant female in light brown, with a center-marked grid pattern connected to her muzzle. Alpine ibex drop their kids in May after a 160-day or 5.6 lunar gestation period. Following the syntax of the pregnant mare and a lunation after the vernal equinox start of the calendar, the dropping of the kids would have been as marked at 2Y, which is 5.6 lunation from when they currently breed. Pictured here on the axial gallery is a birthing aurochs that is often referred to as a leaping cow. Note how the rear legs of both bovines are positioned to be pushing out the calf. The Lascaux artist depicts some inner organs of the aurochs, such as the rumen in red, and what appears to be the elongated white calf sac within her rear area. The Lascaux images of pregnant and birthing animals do not appear to be indicative of hunting magic and tallies, fertility and initiation rites, altered states of consciousness, or art for art's sake. They have seasonal and biological intent. If you ask farmers about such birthing of horses, goats, and cows, they will share that it's about as real as life gets. Female aurochs are considered to have been autumn breeders and would have calved in June and July after a 285-day or 9.6 lunar gestation period, as is common for domesticated cattle today. Following the syntax of the pregnant mare and pregnant ibex and a lunation after the vernal equinox start of the calendar, the dropping of the calves would have been as marked at 4-3Y which is 285 days or 9.6 lunations from when they bred. The grid connected to the muzzle of this birthing aurochs and those grids with the pregnant mare and pregnant ibex supports Marshak's fundamental hypothesis of lunar time-factored knowledge among Ice Age artists. We have taken a few steps further through this presentation by connecting the grids with the life history strategy of the depicted animals in their biological time. We are fortunate to have these pregnant animals in the axial gallery and four others with lunar time factored marks in nearby chambers to work out the syntax. There are also nuances for hand signs that can be found in the geometry of these grids, which I'm open to discuss in another form where there's more time. Through the study of the Lascaux images, hunter-gatherer calendars, and the biological time of the depicted animals, we have added more time factoring tools to explore North American rock art. We have also learned that Marshak's notion of our being more technically advanced than Ice Age people, but not smarter, was more correct than he had imagined. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak at this year's San Diego Rock Art Association Symposium. I am always open to cooperate on projects and virtually present my work to community and academic audiences. Other supporting work can be found on my webpage.